Great. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah, so I was just saying, uh, back in the day, I met Shaggy, and he used to be in the Marines in America, and uh, he was in artillery, and that's the joke. You say you're deaf as a stump, so every time Shaggy, I was like, how you doing, Shaggy? He's like, what? I was like, what the fuck wrong with this guy? And then eventually, he was like, oh, devil, I was I was artillery. It's, a, it's an artillery joke. We're all deaf. You know, I was like, all right. <laughs> I, I have that problem all the time. I've just done a, just done a video, like, update my Patreon supporters. I'm one of the... I'm such an idiot. I have, I've, for, for whenever I record outside the studio, so if I'm in an office, I don't, I don't like to do it often. Also, COVID nineteen, I'm on Skype all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but where I'm recording other places, and and the audio is not the same quality every time. But like, but as soon as I recorded it, when it's raw, mm-hmm. I've I've always struggled with trying to get the audio quality to a decent level to hear. And I go, oh my god, I'm a missus. I miss some of them. We go. That's terrible. Why have you been out like that? And it's only during like COVID I thought, Matt, there's no way I can get it right because I'm half deaf and I've got permanent tinnitus. So it's like a deaf tinnitus sound engineer trying to get your stuff right. Course, it's gonna be wrong. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> right. I got. Well, the thing is, with Skype is pretty good. Quality, it's pretty regular quality every time. So now I, I use Audacity. And I get it into Audacity after, and I just do the same, the same three or four yeah. things. Bang, 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 bang. It's like, right, okay, we got it, we got it now. <laughs> yeah, but I've been using. I guess, I, I guess the program most people use is Pro Tools or Logic, which is variations on a theme, but it's all that digital recording stuff. And literally, here is where the the brain of the, my recording studio is. So I've got like really nice mics and stuff like that. You know, all this kind of shit, kind of sitting around to do my radio show with. You know. But I was, I'm, I'm hesitant. I was going to do something with you where I was going to put it through Pro Tools. But then it's like, you know, most people are listening to it streamed. So it's like it doesn't matter if I have a lot of bass. And it doesn't matter if we have a nice, you know, sound on our voice. Because people are listening to it as they would listen to it stuff on, like, the white earbuds and things. So. Mate, how are you doing the recording with the band while you're there? How would you do that then? Because they're in the States, aren't they? Well, Fast actually lives right outside the M25. Uh, so he's in London, and Frank's from Leicester, right? So Frank's up, up north. So essentially, we're all in the same time zone, in the same country. And a lot of times, like, we're, what we're doing right now, we'll put a Skype call up or a WhatsApp video call and then have the session running. So say I'm recording guitars. I don't know if you can see. I got my guitars set up with, like, an amps and whatnot behind me and things. We mic them up. I'll play some stuff. The guys will listen in. They'll be like, ooh, that was really good at the end. we got to remember that. At the beginning, you were kind of blah, 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 or whatever. And we kind of take it from there. And a lot of times what we'll do is, you know, uh, I'll record stuff here late at night, you know, as the kids go to sleep and the wife's upstairs. I'm in the basement of a five-story house, right? So it's all the way up where the kids and the wife are. I could be down here. And if I'll finish a guitar solo at 1230, 1 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, whatever, I can send it to fast. And if he's up... He might just plop it into the song, do a little engineering, send it back to me. You know, it, it's really kind of a great way to do it because back when we first got signed, it was, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a day for a recording studio. Plus, you got to pay an engineer. Plus, you got to pay an assistant engineer. So it's like a. I think this is the best way to make records. I think it's fun to go into a big studio and record drums and maybe do some lead vocals in a really nice vocal booth and be all like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you don't have to anymore, man. It's a lot cheaper, but the studios are a lot cheaper now as well, though, are they not? I mean, yeah, you're talking no, like... Yeah, I mean, now this, I, knew, I knew this great studio called Dean Street, which is, I think, kind of still around, but it might be privately um, privately owned where they don't, like, release, you know, time to the public. But I remember when all this stuff was happening with the Pro Tools, because you can get, if you're a student, you can get Pro Tools first on your laptop for free. So it's like 36 tracks of digital recording. That's like... You know, back 20 years ago, you would have had to have spent maybe upwards of 20,000 pounds to get a two-inch reel-to-reel tape machine to have 24 tracks. So to 25 years later to have 36 tracks for free and digital, and, you know, that you can adjust the bit rates. I mean, it's pretty impressive how technology is pretty pretty good for that right now. So it's putting all the, the big studios out of business unless, like, there's one around here called Real World, which is Peter Gabriel's studio. I think it's called Real World, and it's like just beautiful. I mean, you'd want to go and spend the money and be there if you had the the means to be in a recording studio all day. I mean, it looks onto a lake and all that kind of stuff. Pretty nice, man. Anyway, salut, my brother. Cheers, mate. (laughs) What are you drinking? I am drinking Costco XO. I'm on uh, Jura 
Jira, age ten years. Oh, nice. So this is the Kirkland brand. You get this. Well, yeah, it's a. This is the stuff you get at Costco. You get like socks that say Kirkland on them, garbage bags, Exo cognac. I mean, you get it all, man. <laughs> America, my bro. America. It's a. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's Costco and uh, and Walmart. I've never been. I've never been. I've never been to Costco. I've never been to Walmart. Like, are they like? Now you've lived in both worlds, right? Mm. Are they like Aldi and Lidl? No, Costco is uh, Costco is kind of a, a, it's really unique, right? So it's like a price club kind of vibe, where it's like a wholesale place, but you can buy like you know, you know, all types of great wine. The great thing about Costco is they have an amazing wine buyer that does like, you know, these big, huge, like 30,000 case buys. So everything's a lot cheaper when you get to Costco. They obviously have some kind of deal with some somebody in Cognac, France to make this fine Cognac and slap the, the Kirkland on it. But it, you find a lot of weird things at Cognac, uh, I mean, in Costco. <laughs> you find Cognac, you find dog beds. The thing is, I go to the one in Avonmouth, right, which is kind of, for me, it's not too far because I'm I'm kind of in bath. I'm in bath, so I just go up towards the M4 and then across and then down the M5 a little bit. And it's like you know I'm there in 20 minutes, and it's like got everything I need. I can get my my Pellegrino water. You know, I get the kids a couple treats. You know, the thing is, like I go there. It was sunny the last couple of weeks. I went there. My wife needed a sun hat. They had a fucking sun hat there. They get everything you need. You name it, it's there. In America, though, I think you can buy like ammunition and things like that, like you can at Walmart. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But that, I mean, uh, the, the comical thing about Aldi and Little is, he, I mean, it, it, it's probably like a bit like Costco. The clothing, you go in, you go in there and mate, you can, you know, you're going down one aisle to get your chicken and your meat and whatever, all mega, mega cheaply priced. And you go down the next aisle and you got your, you know, you got your power tools next yeah. to. Well, the thing is, Costco is all things in bulk too. So in Aldi and Little, I've been in them. You can buy like two breasts of chicken, right? At Costco, they don't do shit like that. You can buy 20 breasts of chicken. And then you're like, well, I got 20 breasts of chicken. Unless you have a platoon of dudes that love chicken, you, you kind of, you know, you got to fucking put them somewhere. So it's kind of hard that way. You Because, you, know, you know, if you don't have a freezer, there's no real point. What's, um, mate, are you find? do you know what I'm finding weird at the minute with this situation with COVID is, um, you, is striking a rapport with new people I'm interviewing because I'm doing it over Skype. Yeah. Weird, man. Such a different dynamic to being in a studio. It is strange. It, it, you know, the thing about uh, being in a space with somebody is that you get a better sense of who who they are as, a, as like, a, obviously as a person, but more as like a, as a soul. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you sit with somebody, like, we hung and I love you, bro. You're a good dude. But I got that impression because I was in a room with you and I understand and your vibe is cool and you're, you emanate good uh, you know what they call it? good vibrations, bro. And that's the thing that sometimes, you know, technology can't, you know, can't do. It can't transcend that human, that human connection that people make. I'm finding, like we were talking last time, how people are getting to the point where, you know, they go out and they want to fight with people outside their household because they've been fighting with people inside their household for so long. So it could be a little bit of people just, you know, at the end of their rope over some shit, you know? Yeah. I, I, no, I didn't. I hadn't realized. I hadn't realized like, until now the, the just how much of an impact the the social cues you get off being in front of someone is. Like mm-hmm. I, I was talking to a I was talking to a lady called Caroline Wyatt, um, who's uh, she's a journalist. Uh, she did a load of stuff in the Middle East. She's a really really cool cool lady, and she was she's a presenter now on on TV and uh, on the radio. No, she's on she's on Radio Four. Radio Four. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was saying, she she was saying about it. She's like, just such a difficult. So you can't see what people are doing with their hands. You yeah. can't. I can be like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. You can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You you can't preempt when to, especially if you're presenting or interviewing. You you can't preempt by their body, the by their body position, what they're doing mm-hmm. when you should be looking to move to the next subject. Mm-hmm. And I I found it a couple of times where. The, I've interviewed one person. I won't name it. It was, a good, it was a good interview. I enjoyed doing it, but it was a bit for me. It was a bit clunky, and I thought, God, afterwards, like, why? Why was that? It's because I haven't got him sat in front of me. There's, yeah. there's the one is the rapport thing, but two, I've got it sat in front of me. I don't know when to move on to the next thing, and it makes me think about, you know, there's the value in again the vid, the YouTube thing about the listening. Man, mm. 
to watch people's expressions, even just as a viewer. Yeah. I mean, and then the stuff that you and I is, I mean, you're obviously a seasoned presenter and a pro at it. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I mean, there are two types of things. On the radio, there's a presenter and there's a DJ. And I always try to make that distinction because I'm not like, hi, everybody, with that funny voice. We're going to do this quiz thing and we're all going to get together. It's more of like, this is a song that you might like. You know, it's just, so it's a different kind of vibe. But so, the second, so, so the second one's a DJ, then? Yeah, I'd say I'm a DJ. I play music. You know, I, I what I try to do, especially when, you know, I'm on the BBC, is to not talk so much. And it's probably because I... It's weird, though, because it, it's strange, because I know that I get to talk all I want when I'm on stage with the band. Sometimes the, the band starts the song, I'm talking so much, they're like, oh, shut this dude up, just start the song. And then that's why I got to stop. I go, all right, all right, I get it. Because I get a little talkative, you know, I know you know that, right? So the point is, when I do the radio, I've already got my, my talk on, you know, with the guys. So I'm just kind of like, all right, let's play the music. Because I know if I don't talk a lot, I can play five more songs to show. So I'm like, well, I'd rather play the five songs. But that's also yeah, no, I would say that I don't get a chance to do much interview stuff anymore because I had some issues where the guys in the Rolling Stones were telling the BBC that they only wanted to talk to me, which is kind of strange. You know, like I, I remember one of my boy Mike called me up and says, do you know Mick Jagger? I was like, I know who he is. I mean, he's in the Stones. He goes, no, but you know him personally. I was like, no, why? He goes, well, he only wants to talk to you. And you don't do interviews. You're not a music journalist. I was like, I know. What the fuck? That's crazy. Why would he want to talk to me? So anyway, it turns out he wanted to talk to me because I was a musician. So it was this one kind of thing. It's like, oh, I'd rather talk to a musician than a presenter. Because you get a presenter up there and they got a whole bunch of other shit going through their head other than, wow, this is, this is fucking Mick Jagger. Let's have a cool conversation with this dude. So I think a lot of ways the way I talk to people is the way I talk to people in my everyday life. Like how would you and me hang out? This is the thing, right? It, it's and it's not to say other other people in your profession aren't authentic. Oh no, but they, you they are, just have a different vibe. No, no, but, but you are obviously authentic. You know, it, mate. It's uh, it, it's almost a it's like a sort of a skill and almost a black art, like to be able to be yourself, like in the in the way we're doing this now, to be yourself when you're um, broadcasting. As in the self you are when you're not broadcasting with your family, when you when you with your mates, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. Um, well, it's challenging at the start. When you get the swing of it, it's really good, and it just it's authenticity, mate. Mm. There's no bullshit there. And in the same way, you and I have this conversation. I like talking to you, and we have got a connection because we both are from a military background, yeah. and you and Mick Jagger are both musicians. There's a there's a, there's a common <laughs> yeah. thing there, right? Yeah. The common well, thing. I mean, it's, it's a weird thing, also. But the way you said that really rang true because it's one of those things where. If you can do what you got to do anywhere in the world under any circumstances, it's a result of training, right? So in the Marine Corps, when and you're, you're, you're a sniper, so you appreciate this. When you go to the rifle range in phase two of boot camp or whatever, they teach you this thing called BRASS F, which is an acronym for breathe, relax, aim, sight, squeeze, follow through. You let the weapon do whatever the weapon's going to do, right? Now, if you can remember that, when you got a bunch of crazy Iraqis or whoever running you down, right? And you can you can post up, you can do that brass F, chances are your ass will live to fight another day, right? So that's one of the things I always try to remember that, you know, it's all a result. If you if you can't get shaken too bad, if you if you know, obviously, you know, they say courage is fear without any just being scared without letting anybody else know you're scared, right? So that's kind of the idea with anything you do in life. You know, I mean I go out on stage sometimes in front of hundreds of thousands of people and I got to make it seem like that shit doesn't mean anything. Like the, not, not that, I mean that, that I'm not, I, I'm not scared by the fact that, Oh shit, I'm in front of 200,000 people. I got to play my music. So to pretend people will see, Oh yo, that dude's pretending he's not scared. But if you're really not fucking scared and you're like, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? They throw a couple beers. Like I still get paid. <laughs> you know, if you think of things pragmatically and you remember brass F just in case anybody rushes the stage, you're going to be okay, right? So that leads me to remember all the people that I knew coming into when I started being a DJ. It was like Chris Evans, Steve Lamack, uh, Mark Radcliffe, you know, all these dudes. And they would give me pointers. And they'd be like, oh, okay, this happens. It all goes to shit. You do this and you just talk over the talk over the instrumental or whatever the, the things are. Pull the fader down a little bit when you talk. It makes it sound like you're cutting through. and stuff. You just remember certain things that you're taught. 
And then, you know, your training kicks in, right? Yeah. But, mate, do you ever get, uh, do you ever get, did you ever get pissed off? Do you ever get pissed off, disillusioned, or fed up with the, with the band side of things? Not the band, but I mean the that creating music, um, uh, performing. Well, I mean, you know, when we first started, when we first got our record deal, right, this was everything we had hoped for. We were like, oh, shit, right? We had uh, a head full of dreams, right, a pocket full of money, and we knew that our job was to make music, play music, make music, play music, and it was a... It was like a cycle that you were doing. When you weren't on the road, you were making a record, and then you go out on the road and you play that record. And that was fine. That's great. It's a great way to make a living for 10 years, for 15 years, right? We're in our 20, what is, this is maybe our 23rd year or 24th year, something like that. So what we tried to do at that point is we realized that if you keep doing anything at that pace, you know, if you talk to a lot of dudes in the military, if, if you're deployed, they don't deploy you for a year anymore. They deploy you for six months and then they reassess. And maybe you have another, you know, another battalion that does what you do that are training and another one's resting. So there's always three. It's like a big machine working. That's how we figured we were going to do it. So also because when we became less popular, you know, as you get older, you become less popular. So we didn't have to put a record out every year. And that was kind of cool for a little while. But then we were like, man, you know, what do we do with our time? And that's when you kind of have to figure, that's kind of a lot like, was it was like for me when I was transitioning out of the Marines, I was like, you know, what do I do to get that level of excitement in my life? You know, because jumping out of airplanes, shooting shit, blowing shit up, that's a pretty high bar, right? So when you get out of something like that, you're like, well, what am I going to do to get my yayas out? I got a job bartending in one of the biggest nightclubs in New York, so shit was hectic all the time, right? So there was that. I also was trying to become a fireman. So I had taken the, the test to, to get into the, the fire department and whatnot. So I always knew that there was something crazy about me, but that was okay. But I knew that I had to keep something crazy going on. So I, I, I think with a lot of what happens when you, when you come into a band situation, it is like almost deploying, right? So you go away for six months and you don't come home. You know, you put your dog in the kennel. If you have a girlfriend, you know, this is before FaceTime and all that shit, you probably, you probably broke up with her. You know what I'm saying? And it was just my light. Just gonna switch my light on two seconds. Yeah, man. The Costco booms. Switch it off because it reflects in the picture. No, mate, you're right. And um, I mean, you either, you know, you either uh, you either find crazy or you find that routine to yeah. match what you were part of, whatever that was, or you try and readjust, man. When I left, I went into. Uh, when I left, I went into the Middle East, private security in the Middle East. Mm. And that routine was I would spend a, a long period away, relatively long period away uh, uh, overseas. Then I would come back and it would be off, switch off, come mm. back. And I knew I was doing no work when I was back. And it was, I mean, I was spending much less time than I did when I was serving. I wasn't six months. It was like two months, sometimes yeah. three months. Come back for maybe three and a half, four weeks. But I was in the same cycle I was when I was serving. Mm. And that was, that was exactly what I needed. But the problem was then when I when I came back to the UK and tried to try to have that more time with the family, you know, just try and settle down the roots into roots. Yeah, that's what I need. Get routine, be brilliant. Mate, it was not what I wanted. It was not my body or it was the body wasn't ready for it. My mind was not ready for it. Mm-hmm. It was an it mate, it was a baptism of fire. Like yeah. the toughest I landed a really good job. Um a really good job, like working from home most of the time. Uh, work look get this. Working from home and getting uh, and getting um, company car company uh, a car allowance money paid towards my fuel every month. I'm working from home. Thank <laughs> you. That's the, yo, I like. You should tell me who that company was, man. <laughs> and it was a yeah yeah. And it was a mate. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. I did not. I did not know what to do with myself. Did not know what to do with myself. If I'm honest, it's, it's if I'm honest, it, the COVID situation. I literally have been thinking this the last few days. The COVID situation has brought me to a, a position where. I'm comfortable. I'm, I'm I'm now comfortable uh, chilling out and sitting down and watching a program on TV. Basically, sitting down and doing nothing productive, and yeah. that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> it was when you well, well, yeah. I mean, the COVID thing's kind of for. I, I know this sounds kind of weird, but for touring musicians, I mean, we get in a bus and we'd be in the bus. If you're in America, you'd be in the bus maybe 24 hours or something like that with you know six seven eight other guys and a, and a, a couple tvs and 
that's how you dealt. It was like being on a submarine in a lot of ways. We used to call it the Chinook because we had to get on the bus, man. We got to get going. Because it's like that's how you lived your life. And it was very insular. So when this thing kicked off and we couldn't go anywhere, I could see my wife being a little like, oh, what's going on? Because, you know, we could go out a little bit to the park and stuff. But for me, I was like, fine, I'll just watch The Godfather for the 50th time. It's cool, you know. <laughs> and I guess that comes with, you know, being able to, if you know you're on mission, you can kind of deal with the boredom if you know that you're there where you need to be. If your purpose is good, can, can be served at any moment, you're cool having that downtime. I think me anyway now. Yeah, I think for me, it was, I, again, these are, these are recent revelations yeah. and understandings. It might take years, right? I think for me it was that with the – so when I, was, when I was serving or when I was doing that stuff in the Middle East – when I came back, mate, I was quite happy to chill and do nothing for a month. You know, and just dedicate all my time to the kids, you know, to do whatever I wanted to do. And I think that's because of two things. One, I felt in my, in, you know, in my mind's mind that I'd earned that. That was yeah. my R&R. And two, I knew I was going back. I knew I was going back yeah. out. So it's yeah, like, yeah. okay, rest and recuperate. You're going back out. And now yeah. where, I find my, where I find my time, mate, I literally I really struggle to do, like I said, Watch, watch some dog shit on TV. And there's value in watching dog shit on TV, right? <laughs> but I think it's because I've not felt, I haven't earned that. And again, I'm not getting ready to rest and getting ready to go off and smash myself on something. It's weird, man. Weird. Well, I, mean, yeah. I, see you, I mean, you you don't take a whole bunch of time off. I imagine when you work with the Rubicon guys, it's not like, you know, I mean, it, it, when you were in Africa, I think when, when we first started talking, you were you were in Africa with them, right? Mm, Mozambique, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that was after the the crazy floods and shit, right? The rains that kind of took everybody out. I mean, when you go out to that, I wanted to actually know about this. When you go out there and they're all like kind of like minded individuals at Rubicon, right? I mean, do you guys do you guys look at it as this is this is what we're supposed to be doing now? Well, interesting conversation about Team Rubicon, mate. And this is why. The only like-mindedness I found on that on that mission out there was everyone was willing to give their time to go and help. Okay, mm-hmm. so we weren't all ex-military. In fact, the team I was part of, uh, there was it, was it was six people, four were civvies. Oh, really? I, was, I thought you yeah, started with the Marine though, a U.S. Marine, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So Team Rubicon was. So, t- so you got Team Rubicon started in, in America with a couple of US Marines. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then it's sort of, it's a bad phrase, but it's sort of, it's sort of franchises of it around the world. Okay. So Team Rubicon UK is an independent, almost an independent thing of Team Rubicon. And same, same, same overall, like overhead structure. Same, yeah. like, same uh, cap. yeah, same logo. Team Rubicon USA predominantly, they prov- predominantly provide medical support. Team Rubicon UK mm-hmm. predominantly provide uh, last mile logistics. They get shit to places that no one else can get to, you know. Um, yes, and, and they predominantly recruit ex-military. The, but the fact of the matter was when I was on that team in Mozambique, it was two-thirds of the team were civvies. The team leader was a 23- or 24-year-old civvy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other guy who was ex-military, was ex-royal uh, engineer, mate, and I, I mean, I walked onto that team and I realized, I thought, oh my God, what the fuck? I get me out of here. Cause I, 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 I mean, I saw, I saw four civvies and I saw a team leader, yeah. a 24 year old. I thought, what the fuck? We're doomed. Yeah. And, um, yeah. but, but within 40 hours, maybe less than that, I thought, this is, this is, this is pretty good. Weird. Because it's the value in diversity in the team. It's also mm-hmm. when, mate, it's the volunteering thing. These guys, the four of them, and they're all young. Oh, no, most of them are young. They, they're going, right, I'm going to get my time. I'm going to Mozambique. Mate, and it was dangerous, right? I'm going to Mozambique. Yeah, Mozambique and I'm going to go. And so you cannot do anything but go, mate, I am, you know, you are my brother. I'm your brother. And I came off the back of that three and a half weeks I spent with that team, looking at them as if I'd done a six-month tour when I was back in. Because you can't, you can't not, you know. I mean, I wanted to pull my hair out sometimes. You know, I mean, they probably do with me. Yeah, with the finest of bros. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's one of those things where I saw that. I was like, man, you know, and, you know, we, we talked about it a, a little bit last time about social responsibility, right? And you know, I think a lot of a lot of times, if you're ex forces, ex military, you know, ex you know, first responders, all this have cops, firemen, 
you always have that in the back of your mind, like, yeah, I'm supposed to help, right? I mean, that's the idea. If I can help, I can help, right? And with this whole COVID thing, you see that, I guess you see that philosophy put in practice and you see people tripping about it as well. Like, you know, fuck it, I'm going to do what I want. And, and that's, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, people get shamed now for, for, you know, doing all this kind of like, you know, so anti-social distancing. You see a lot of weird things in America with a lot of protests happening, but that's another story for another time. But I, I, I think that if a lesson can be learned from this lockdown thing and how this country in particular are doing so well with the, the social distancing, it goes down to people really trying to be socially responsible. And that's kind of a, it's a new way to look at being in a society. Yeah, it's definitely, tr- it's definitely, it's definitely changed. I think I'm, I can't remember if I mentioned this last, well, last time when we had a conversation, is that, is that, is that, um, do you know what I'm, I'm really enjoying at the moment is that, so I grew up in South Wales, in the valleys in South Wales, mate. Mm-hmm. whether you walk through that village, whether you know the person walking towards you down the pavement or not, all right, they will always say hello, you will say look at the back, whether they're a man or a woman, whether, whether yeah. they're black or white, whether they're flipping whatever, right, you say hello to you, you say hello to them, it might even be a conversation as you go past, like a mini conversation, oh yeah, all good, yeah, yeah, they're just, you know, one of those means nothing conversations, but you just mean, yeah. hey, most of the places I am in, in the, I've been in the UK, apart from places like, you know, the deepest, darkest steps of North Yorkshire and, you know, the farming areas, right? But people don't say hello to each other. They don't. They just walk past each other because but it's just not, it's like, because I think it's because there's more, one, when you're in more built-up areas, there's more risk, there's more threat, there's more, yeah. you know, you just, there's more, um, a ang- bit of anxiety there. But what's been happening now is where people have been having to, a lot more having to, you know, Get out of the, keep two meters away, so they make a, a more of an obvious effort to get out of your way, so the elderly can pass or whatever. <laughs> People are are talking to each other more when they're out walking about strangers. And what I've noticed as well, off the back of that, the point of this is, even when people don't have to talk to each other, ten yards away walking past, you get a nod or you get a hello. It wasn't yeah. happening before. I love that man. I, I love think that. that's great too. I mean, I live in Bath, right? And Bath is a little bit posh, right? And I've never been. I've never been. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a really nice place to live. I live here because I really love it. But, you know, on the surface, you'd be like, mm, okay. And maybe the people are a bit stuck up here and there. But with this thing in particular as well, I mean, I, I'm the type of person, if someone's on my block and they live on my block and I've seen, even if I don't know them, if they're walking on the street, because my kid's playing on the street as well. So it's like, I'm out there. You know, I say hello to everybody. That's just how I was brought up. I come from a, a, a little neighborhood in New York City on the Lower East Side that was everybody knew everybody. So you say hello to everybody because you guys had each other, you know, you're all in that boat together. Right. And now I think a lot of people are figuring out that great quote from uh, Martin Luther King, which I just paraphrased. We might've come here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And if the COVID can teach us to be more civil to each other and just nod, Hey, how you doing? Cause I see old folks, you know, and, and I'm like, Hey, how are you? And they're like, Oh, I'm okay. Young man. How you doing? I'm like, Oh, you call me young man, even with this. And we have a little thing. And like you said, it's a nothing conversation for maybe us. But that lady might go back and go, you know what? Society isn't fucked. That young man was kind of nice. You know what I'm saying? And you could yeah. give, give people, you know, the idea that they are part of a, a neighborhood. They are part of a, a society that, you know, is not completely cold hearted. Because we see so much of that shit, especially, you know, just the way everybody's trying to be Snoop Dogg all of a sudden, too. You know, everybody's gangster. Everybody's blood and crippin', you know, so... I think it's nice to see that people are actually being nice just for the sake of being nice because there's nothing in it for you to say hey to somebody, but you're kind of feeling that you're part of it now because everybody could possibly, you know, I think everybody's affected by this virus. I'm just kind of unsure about how it's being portrayed as far as it, as it's, you know, as a virus in of itself, you know what I'm saying? I know we, we, we probably talked about this a little bit last time that I think there's a lot of fear mongering going on. And I think a lot of a lot of times, especially in the United States, there's there's political reasons for for doing things that are just counterintuitive to helping everybody out. And you see how many people got it, how many people died from it. But you don't see the most important part of the equation is how many people recovered from it, you know, which is as big as almost as big as the number of people who got it. And I think we, if we concentrated on that more and just the light at the end of the tunnel, we'd probably be better off rather than just being so shit scared. Cause in 
you know, where I come from in New York, they got hit super hard because no one really gives a fuck in New York, right? They just, you know, they don't care. They're, essentially, you know, what happened in New York is all the people that were really hard, uh, hard done by with respiratory issues and pre-existing things, when that thing hit town, they all died under like a three-week period. And now that's now they've all passed away, the people that were really, really sick, you're starting to see more people getting it and not being adversely affected. Like all those, all those respirators that they were crying about, they're not even using them anymore. So, you know, and also that, you know, we were talking about last time that, that, uh, that what is it? Anti, I think it's an anti AIDS, antiviral drug. That is, if they catch you, if you have it, you're starting to get a real bad reaction to the respiratories and the, and the symptoms, they give you this antiviral and it lessens it to a point where you don't have to go to hospital. I mean, that, that's the thing we should be thinking about. Like 99 Point eight percent of the people don't have to go to hospital. That's amazing. You know, the other people who are in the care homes, though, that's the sin where you see all the old folks just getting wiped out like a swath of them. It's just terrible. Yeah, it's a nightmare. I, I, it, going back, it is, it is it's just political point scoring and, and, outra- and outrage media. But I think mean, the thing is, man, we, it's a blessing, really, that when you go out, when we talk, when we were talking on, we were talking there about people going down the street and saying hello and. Hey, a lot of those people are the same people that will be inside and going fucking mental on social media, right? It will be going mental. It will be going mental. Imagine, imagine you you would walk. Imagine you would walk around, right? And your social media sort of your your key like profile is is, is like printed. <laughs> yeah. T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But vegan. Ninety five you know. percent of his likes are left lefty. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the like the Corbyn tweet once. You know, he's like, you fucking wanker. <laughs> it's Which, weird, but weird, though, yeah, I mean, it, I think in a lot of ways, because people have now been forced to concentrate on their online avatars and their online in their mind shit, because their real lives have been put on hold, they're realizing that they're, they're probably better off in, in, as my kid calls it, IRL, in real life, than being this weird, super angry, super triggered person on social media. Because I'm, it's funny because I don't, you know, I, you know, I don't do my social media, right? I, I, I do some shit on Instagram, but that's just because it's funny and, you know, I, I try not to offend. But Twitter, I just can't do it because I don't care about some dude not liking what I do. I don't give a fuck about him. But it's funny because I don't do it, right? So people go on Twitter and they'll, they'll, you know, tear me a new asshole and call me every name in the book and no one replies, and they get even angrier, you know. It's like, and then like, and then they call your mother up and they tell you they're gonna they're gonna do something horrible to your dog, and you're like, and then no one answers them. They, they get even more furious. I'm just imagining the dude with the beard in his mom's basement just kind of breaking the keyboard over his head because I won't tell him to go fuck himself. And then you know, it's just like stuff like that just makes me giggle. But you see a lot of people that you know, and you can look in their eyes. Or actually, they're the people that don't look you in the eyes. Those people, you know, go back home and they're just like, dah, 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 dah. and it's just really ferocious. And, you know, that that energy could be better placed. You know, I mean, I was a young kid with a horrible idea of how I was supposed to spend my time. And I became a Marine and I realized I could channel my energies to something that was more productive, you know. And I think that's what people can learn from this whole fucking thing. It's like, yo, you can change your, your you could change your whole shit up in the time that you've been in quarantine or in, in lockdown, right? I mean, it's oh, it's going to be three months, maybe four months before shit gets back to normal. You get some of those, you know, those people who are out of shape. I Me, mean, myself, I'm, I'm going to put myself back into shape. I've been doing my sits and my pulls every day. I'm fucking shit up. My wife actually was like, yo, you look good. I was like, word. And it's one of those things because I have the time. And most people who are busy, like, I got a lot of shit to do all the time. But I'm like, yo, you know, I can drop and give myself 20 right now. And I do, blah, 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 punch them out. And, you know, you can change... When they say uh, uh, 10 days, you can break, uh, you can't break a habit. 30 days, you can start something that will last. And that's what I think I'm trying to do. And, you know, I'm not saying I've been an example to be followed, but a lot of people who want to change something about themselves can do it in this time. This time can make you, you can, you can learn a language. You can, you know, study for the bar exam and become a lawyer because the world needs a lot more of those or whatever you want to do, you can do it and you can lay off the fucking Twitter and it's probably going to do your head a little bit good too. That's but that's the challenge, right? Is getting away from the social media. It's so immersive, and I'm not. I'm not preaching, man. I am. I. I. It ebbs and flows for me. It ebbs and flows for mm-hmm. me. 
I, yo, I take pictures of my puppy. I'm all like, yo, no, that, that's not the right picture. And my puppy's like, what the fuck? I'm a puppy. I was like, no, we got to get the light right. Yo, I try to stunt my puppy on the Instagram for real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the puppy. But I know what you're saying. It's, very, it's one of those things where it's so easy to catch that little dopamine hit. You know, so it's it's one of those things where, you know, some people it goes unnoticed that that's what they're actually doing. But if you are aware of it, like when I quit smoking, I read this book by Alan Carr, right? Not the chatty man, Alan Carr, but the Alan Carr, the smoking dude, right? And one of the first things they, they get you to understand is that you're addicted to a drug. You're addicted to nicotine. You're a drug addict, right? So if you break it down to the simplest terms and, and just no dilution, straight, no chaser, and you can deal with a certain fact of life that that's what happens when you get a like or something on Twitter or, or Facebook or something like that. And you can actually realize that you can get that somewhere else in your life by maybe working out or falling in love or being nice to an actual living thing. That kind of stuff can transcend. So, you know, I have hope. But, you know, I mean, I, I get in trouble all the time on Twitter because I just disparage it all the time because I don't give a fuck about it. And the people who it's when that's their life. They get really offended that you don't give a fuck about their their Twitter. And it's kind of, I guess it's coming around on me a bunch of ways because I kind of fucked up on Twitter back in the day. And then I was kind of involved in it trying to, you know, figure out what was a, what would it, what about it really upset me. And then I realized it's the, the obvious anonymity of people and their input into how you think you're doing. You know, back in the day, man, I didn't give a fuck about somebody in Philadelphia or, or Taiwan commenting on something I did. It's like, I would, if they said like, oh, some guy in Taiwan said that, 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 I'd be like, fuck them. But because it's on Twitter and all things are equal, you can kind of see how people can take things a little bit more personally than they should. So I just cut it off, man. And I say, it's like where weirdos go for company and it just triggers everybody because they're fucking weirdos, you know? Yeah. I, I, I have a rule where it's don't respond to ne negativity. It's actually, yeah. I picked it up for you. I, re I picked it up from Joe Rogan, and I, I yeah. and uh, man, it is hard sometimes. It is fucking hard. Oh, um, dude, I don't even check it anymore. I, I never check my mentions because I know there's somebody telling me to go eat my mom or whatever, you know. Some of them cut me deep, mate. I did. I remember when I did my interview with Lev Wood, um, Levinson Wood. He's a, if you don't know him, he's he's a serving power regis officer, and he got became a, you know he's a basic explorer. He's a he's a he's a cool guy. Oh, he's I know that dude. Uh, yeah, 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 Levinson Wood. And uh, someone, is it on YouTube? Someone put on their, uh, <laughs> cut me really deep. <laughs> someone put on their, uh, yeah, Lev yeah, Levison, Levison's a great guy, da, 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 but, but, but your man, he's a bit thick. <laughs> that was me. Like, what? That's obviously an officer writing that comment, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, now I'm just like, I'm just like, <laughs> I, you, you let let the fans handle it, you know. And uh, mate, a night. This is the thing, mate. It, what kind of a person goes online and puts some and puts a negative comment, which is directed as a person, as a as a, as a, as a single person, right? Now, politics is a bit different. When we're talking about stuff like you and I do, mm. mate, they, they mate, they're just crying out for attention. That's well, what that's they're a, doing. That's exactly crying what out it for is. attention. I mean, you look at some of the shit that happened over this lockdown, right? It started and Sam Smith had someone shoot a video of him crying, right? Like him weeping openly. He did that for one reason, attention. My man can't go get his attention at the nightclub or on fucking TV or on MTV, so he's got to cry on fucking social media. All right, that's one thing. And then you got, and now is it is it Colonel Tom? Because he was Captain Tom for a minute, right? The 99-year-old gentleman who served in World War II who said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put on a fucking suit and I'm going to walk around my garden for fucking ever to make money for the NHS because I fucking have some thing called social responsibility. Now, if you look at these two things objectively, you go, well, I'm really proud to be, I mean, I, I say I'm part British now. My wife's British. My, my kids are British. I live, I've lived here 12 years. I'm proud of that kind of stuff, that Captain Tom stuff. That's one of the things that makes England one of the best places in the world, that, that intestinal fortitude. I admire it, right? And then I'm thinking... Who, who's got who's got more clout though in the real world unfortunately Colonel Tom doesn't it's this fucking guy Sam Smith and I don't know him from Adam apparently he's a good singer I think he fucked up the Bond theme that he did but the fucking thing right is you did. Yeah, radio, so you know, radio, radio, radio had nailed it radio yeah, had yeah, it dope man yeah but the, the, a lot of the times you know the way people get clouded in this world it just doesn't seem fair 
And I th- and we were talking about how this thing will change how people live their lives from here on out. Hopefully, we will esteem people like Captain Tom over dudes who just want to get some attention by weeping openly. You know what I mean? And also, as a father, and we talked about this before, I want my children, obviously, to be socially responsible and have a self, self-discipline and self-determination. But at the same time, I want them to be non-fragile. You know, I want them to have a durability, you know, a resilience that it took me a long time to acquire. It took me (laughs) serving in the Marines to do it. But, you know, I want them to not be affected so adversely by such not serious shit. I mean, you know, we're talking about Captain Tom. He had to go fight the Nazis. That was his fucking pack to carry. A lot of these young people, they got to sit in their house and watch fucking reruns of Love Island. That's completely different. Shut the fuck up. You know what I'm saying? So when I see people kind of, you know, I, I, I posted something the other day about, you know, that old movie where the dude got the sunglasses and he takes them off and he sees it one way and he puts them on and it says something else. The Roddy, 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 Roddy Piper movie. Anyway, it was funny because it's like, you know, they're like, you know, they're, they're talking about, you know, uh, the idea of, you know, being locked down equals communism. And it's like, well, if, if you have nothing to compare anything to, everything's communism, everything's racist. Everything's you're taking everything personally, you know, and that doesn't that doesn't bode well for those people when they grow up and have to have responsibility and pressure put on them. Because if they're going to crack at some shit like that, when you have real pressure, like like being a parent, uh, running a household, uh, you know, trying to make your way in the world and that pressure will crack you and you'll break. And then those people who rely on you will be fucked. So that's the whole point that I was trying to make with the whole Sam Smith Captain Tom thing, but you know, as I say, there's always people who are as 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 high minded as you. I thought that comment was that I made. Like, I think that dude's amazing. They took it as, well, you think he's shitty, and it's like, you know, it's they're not mutually exclusive. You know what I'm saying? And nuance is not something that's you know a thing that's acquired on social media. No, absolutely not. Do you know what astonished me about Captain Tom, mate, and what it, what it made me realize it is pretty astonishing about that whole generation, mate. We know how fucking hardcore they are. Yeah. But from my experience, you know, just going through life, man, shit, you know, shit fucks with the person you are. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it changes you. You do not stay on the same course as the person. You don't hold the same values and standards all the way through. You may. It's like skim close to what they were, you know, but not, <laughs> no drastic changes. But you, you, you're not the same person when you're older as when you're younger. Mate, Captain Tom Moore, right? And that whole generation, when you consider what that guy has lived through, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he is the man, right? He is the man he was when he was fighting the Nazis. He's the same yeah. guy, right? Now, when you consider that was the 40s, right? Moon landings, yeah. JFK getting assassinated, all the fucking mine strikes in the UK, mm-hmm. the fucking Korean War, mate, the Falklands conflict, the Gulf War. Everything Computers, fucking space shuttles, all this shit. Yeah, the Iranian embassy siege. Yeah, the yeah. first woman prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Mate, mm. and then consider technology, you yeah. know, smartphones, internet, all of this stuff. He's the same dude as he was then. He yeah. doesn't give a shit. Yeah, yeah. I he mean, doesn't it must, care. It, it, it's the exponential kind of speed in which things kind of accelerated that people of that generation must be like, whatever. You know, and I think I, I, I admire the fact that they don't get too off their center. It seems like a lot of times you see people that if something happens to them, they, they swing 180 degrees for it. And then it's hard to swing that pendulum back without going to the other side, you know, to the dark side, as they say. Do you know what I think it might be, mate? I think it might. So for me, I am now like I have got core values. There are, there are core values in me, which I will. I'm so they're so ingrained in me now. I will never, ever veer from them. Just core values. I might change the person, but my core values will never mm-hmm. change. You know, integrity, honesty. You mm-hmm. know, the, the, I mean, there's two of them, right? There's probably the only two. Integrity, honesty. <laughs> they'll do it, right? No, I, I hear what integrity, you mean. Integrity, honesty. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and, and reliability is another one, okay? So mm-hmm. they're my core values, right? Now, it's taken me a long time to truly believe those and hold them as core values. I think maybe with Captain Tom Moore's generation, fuck me, man, they had to have those when they were young. Yeah. They had to have those when they were young, and they took them on board, emotionally invested in them, and saw the value in them from when they were dead young because they're getting smashed by the Germans. They had well, to have well, it. You, 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 
You said it values, man. They were valued. Those traits were valued. How much is honesty valued now? You know, how much is reliability when you can buy a new one? It's, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole different thing. We're talking about, uh, esteeming too easy. You know, maybe we, we, we obtain too cheaply, you know, and, and things that we, we, that we used to take a lot of work to get, you know, I mean, it, I mean, it, it's just kind of weird where you see how that, you know, for instance, I hate to go back to Sam Smith because it's not really about him, but it's about the idea of someone like Kim Kardashian being more world famous than say someone like the Dalai Lama, you know what I mean? It's it just like, they just, it's it just, I think the values have shifted to something different than what we think values are. And I'm sure that, you know, no one's, no one's kind. Also, maybe this, maybe you didn't have a whole bunch of time back in that generation to have other values. <laughs> you know what I mean? You couldn't, you couldn't value other shit because there was literally not time in your life. You also didn't live that long either. And you were fucking with the Germans too. So, I mean, you probably had less time to be self well, yeah, I guess be feeling, you know, the idea of people being very self-absorbed nowadays. And that's the thing I see on the fucking news all the time. It's like they, someone's having a bad time with this. You know, everybody's having a fucking bad time with this. But, you know, you know, bite your lip, man. You'll be okay. Breathe. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I understand that some people have it worse than others. And I'm not being dismissive. I just think the whole idea of including everybody in this blanket of, of like, predisposed weakness. I don't think a lot, most of the people I know are not weak minded. You know, I know a lot of people who, who go through certain shit for certain reasons, but it's not like something like this is really going to make them, you know, freak out as much as a lot of people are freaking out. I just think that we're not valuing things like reliability and, you know, the whole idea of not getting rattled and not panicking. You know, I mean, that was probably one of the things that I, I had to come to terms with. I was a nervous kid. You know, I was, I grew up a, in a very weird situation where I didn't have a dad and uh, it was me and my mom. So I was always kind of at a, at a young adolescent age. I almost felt like I had to protect my mom in a certain way. So I was always kind of like head on a swivel, kind of, you know, a little bit of, not a nervous kid outwardly, but inside I was probably a little bit nervous. I was prone to kind of having a bit of a, 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 maybe a panic streak, right? And I remember a couple of times when I was in early one in boot camp, when they drop you in the fucking pool with a pack on you, know, they, they don't expect you to swim. And it's just one of those things where you're like, bloop, and, you, and you go, and you realize, oh, I'm supposed to take the fucking pack off. Oh, I get it. I get it now. And this is why you're kind of losing oxygen and the fucking tunnel vision's happening. You're like, oh, I get it now. And you take the pack off and the pack fucking floats. Oh, shit. And then you learn that panicking is just going to cost you maybe your life, you know. So uh, it's, it's kind of weird. It, there was a. There was an idea of a TV show called Scared Straight in New York back in the day, or it was an American show maybe. And they would take these little punk kids that thought they were tough, and they bring them to like Rikers Island or Sing Sing Prison and shit, and they put them in front of these these real hard motherfuckers that were in for life, and they'd be like, "Ooh, I can't wait for you to come to this jail, motherfucker!" And these kids were like, and you could see them, and like the guards would leave. The guards would like just leave and walk out, and these prisoners would be like, "Yo, yo, yo!" And the kids were like, "Oh." Fuck peeing themselves, crying, but they came out of that shit like, yo, I'm not fucking tough no more. I'm, you know, they were scared straight. And that was the idea of the show. If you do that show today, they would have, I mean, it would be suicides and fucking lawsuits and all types of shit. So my I'm, man, surprised was, I'm surprised it was allowed back then, mate. Oh, Jesus dude. Christ. No, but it was the, the fucking <laughs> illest show. I mean, we used to laugh about it because we were like, yeah, if that dude said that shit to me, I'd just punch him in his mouth. But we all knew deep down that we were not going to be criminal gangsters at that point. Yeah, it was a great show, man. But it just, it, it lets you, it brings you into the real world. It goes, yo, it shakes you a little bit. It goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what it's really about. So what you got is not as bad as you think you got. You know, that's maybe, I guess that's the grass is always greener syndrome, right? Do you, uh, on, on the subject of that kind of, that TV scare, scaredy stuff. There's a, there's a good British word, scaredy. 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 <laughs> it's like baddie. That's another good one. <laughs> Who are the baddies? The baddies, the bad guys. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you have you ever watched um, SAS? He dares wins. Uh, yeah, because we, we we have a mutual friend, Foxy, Jason. Well, uh, no, he's not. He's not a mate of mine. He's a mate of a mate. He's a mate. Oh, yeah. Of a mate. yeah. I, I I'll, 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 he's a good dude. He's a good dude. But you know what? I saw the other day. I was waiting for the news to start, and my wife, I think, was upstairs. So it was on. So I'm like, oh, I'll put it on, right? 
there was some guy on it who's like a boxer. He's like a professional fighter, right? Hard looking, no. fucking big dude. Northern Tony, one. Tony Bellew. Tony, yeah, big dude, right? And Ant was like trying to get in his shit about something, and you see, he, Ant got up in my man's face, and my man was like, "Oh, that's what real tough motherfuckers are like." He wasn't. I mean, Ant's not a professional boxer. But I think Ant would have fucking ripped him up if it got down to it. You know what I mean? And it was kind of like, oh. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. We really? don't know about I, that, <laughs> well, it, the, the thing was, and then I think Ant posted something because uh, uh, my boy sent me this whole thing about it. He thought it was hilarious. We were talking about it. He was like, yo. And my man was like, yo, I will. And Ant said something like, I'll, I'll take a shot to the jaw from a professional boxer to stand up. With. And all this. I was like, yo, that's TV for you. But pretty good TV at that, man. It was, mate. I've, I've never been one to watch those programs, right? And because... They I asked me to be on it, dude. They asked me to be on that episode, that, that this series, the one that's going on. No. Right. Well, Jay, I used to work with Jay. You know Jay Morton? Yeah. So he is a mate. Well, I, I, I used to work with mate used to. We used to work together. You know, I'd buy him a beer. We'd be on the piss together, right? Um, and... Uh, what was I going... Where was I going then? Why did I even mention that? Oh, what I liked about it. Sorry, what I like about it, mate, you were right not to go on that show. Fuck that, man. I did that shit for real. I don't need to go this, fucking do some shit on TV. Right, I'm mate. I'm also so 51 this, years old. I want to be where the fuck they are, cold and miserable. There ain't no this, Costco cognac in there. This is why I like it, right? Is that um, there's absolutely an element of theatrics in there. There's absolutely an element, like there is in anything, right? There is some... You know, some stuff's a bit staged, and there's probably some storylines injected, yeah. right? But I, so I can't watch that stuff anyway because I don't want to watch it. And go, that's fucking bollocks. Ain't that bullshit? Or, or you could, it's just blatant. Or they're not getting beasted enough. Or they're being too politically correct with it, right? Yeah. I remember my missus. My missus, I'd watched the series, and then she put another one on. I was like, fuck. And I ended up watching it. I thought, man, hey, it was refreshing because it's a lot more. They get away with a lot more than what I thought. And also, regardless of how many theatrics are in there, or storylines are injected, people falling out. Mm. Mate, when they're getting thrashed, you know, on that last episode, when they're on that high, that high line, <laughs> going across the rope, and has to do the regain. And that regain, mate, is not yeah. easy. No, no one was no, ever going to... No one was ever going to achieve that. a kid, it sucked. Yeah. No one was ever going to achieve that, right, on that episode. They're really getting thrashed, mate. When they're in the water, that's really happening. Regardless of what happens beforehand or after. I don't care if they get a hot meal beforehand or a yeah. hot meal after that you don't yeah. see on camera. They still got fucking thrashed. Yeah, they went thrashed. through it. Absolutely thrashed. There's value, there's value in it, mate. There's value I, in what the, 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 We're talking about the, the, the theatrics of it. What I like is like, do you guys have series school? Uh, the survival, evasion. Oh, yeah. Just, Seer. Yeah. Yeah, Seer. yeah, we have that in the Marines as well. So, what I love is they have that kind of thing where they have the two instructors and then they bring the guy in with the hood and they fucking pull the hood up. And then they have like a heart to heart, which I think is kind of funny. Rhythm. It's usually some guy like, oh, when I was young, this happened to me. And you're like, all right, I don't think it was going to go there so quick, you know, because you wouldn't open up to anybody like that normally. Right. But you're right. It's at this. I guess they get people to that extent. Like, because I remember when I first got in the military, it's like, you know, they, they rev you into the red. And then while you're in the red. They try to teach you how to operate while you're in the red. So you stop panicking, you start thinking, you start using procedure and training and all that kind of stuff. And the one thing that they didn't say to me ever in, in on Paris Island was, how are you feeling? <laughs> Which is kind of like what those dudes do. The dudes are like, you're like so amped up and emotional and shit like that. They go, how are you feeling? They go, well, when I was a child, oh my God. And then it gets into this theatrical thing. And then the, you can see the instructors kind of like trying not to laugh. Like, Foxy's got that look where he's, like, looking around, like, I'm about to laugh, yo, you need to cut. And then they pull the dude out of there. But, you know, stuff like that I think is interesting because most people don't have – it's a good window into what it's like to be initiated into a military brotherhood, right? I don't know what boot camp is like for from Army in, a, in Britain, but I imagine it's pretty much the same kind of shit, you know? They see who's going to fall out, who's a team player, who's not. You try to physically get that person better over a period of months. You try to teach them some kind of military occupational specialty, how to shoot or whatever. And then they go, they get dropped into their, their MOS, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was it? Well, I was going to mention something and then you started fucking talking, Huey. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, what was I thinking about? Oh, Seer schools. Mate, funny you mentioned Seer schools. I've been to 
So in the UK, I can't remember the actual the full name of the 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 training school. It comes under RAF command. Um, but I've been talking to the guy who runs the whole thing. He runs the whole thing for. Uh, for <laughs> the, yeah, I'm just he's ex he's ex mil ex pilot, um, but he, he's now like an expert in survival, survival expert. Um, mm. And uh, I'm listening to his audio book at the minute, John. John Hudson, I think his name is. Hopefully, going to get him on the podcast, mate. Yeah, but cool. it, 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 it reminded me, right? So it reminded all all pilots have to do that, like an element of the survival training. That. Yeah. It reminded me of a guy, a guy I know, a mate, a mate called uh, he's called Nathan, and Nathan was a pilot in the RAF. And listen to this, right? So Nathan's flying. Nathan's flying a C. I think it was a C seventy. Right, I'm no pilot, an RAF guy. It's a big fucking bird, okay? With 200 or 100, 150 troops in the back, right? Loads of them, okay? He's in the pilot seat or the co-pilot seat. The plane, oh, right, he's a co-pilot. The pilot's flying. The pilot does some, some. he tries to do some, like, in inverted commas, manual control of the of the steering mechanism. He, ja he I can't remember what it was. Anyway, something gets jammed. Right, it jams the plane into a downward <laughs> plummet, mate. The whole thing immediately, right? The force of it sends Nathan, who's not got his belt on, it sends him through uh, into the roof of the cockpit. Okay, in the in the back, where all the troops are, the force is that much, mate. All They're the troops, on. yeah, but all the troops with no belt on, they go through the the inner fuselage, through oh. the insulation, like. Yeah. Smash through it and against the metal outer hull of the plane, mate, while this is going down. So Nathan hits the roof, it's diving, he's stuck to the roof with the gravity. The pilot's like unconscious, I think. He basically crawls down the he told me his first hand, mate. I was like, What the fuck? <laughs> he crawls down, mate. He managed to crawl along the top of the roof because he's <laughs> his plummet is against it. Like in fucking well, you see it when they get pinned when they're in an elevator, they get pinned yeah. to the roof. He managed to crawl down along scrambles himself back into the chair and pulls this thing out of a nose dive, mate. He broke his fucking back when he hit the roof. Broke his back, mate. Yeah, broken back. Mate, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Crazy people out there. Mate, he's still, I think he's still flying today. What an idiot. <laughs> like, I'll tell you, that's, really that's the powers of adrenaline, man. I know you've probably seen adrenaline take care of a lot of stuff that afterwards you're like, Wait, uh, where is my leg? You know, I have a friend who, who didn't know that he was pretty much he got an amputation, and it was like it was still in his pants, but it was not there anymore. And he just was so adrenalized, he went for like a mile, and then he figured it all out. Man, it's crazy. But that's you know when you see, I mean, that's why I want a military pilot flying my airplane commercially. That's why I love seeing like dudes that are, are ex-military flying. Like I think Virgin has a lot of ex-military guys flying for them. I don't know if they're even around anymore. Did you hear about all that crazy shit about the airlines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really definitely be charging more per bag. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that means you need a second mortgage to buy a Ryanair fucking ticket. <laughs> like all the traveling I do, my man, and I travel all the time, and I'm not proud. I travel coach. I don't give a fuck. Well, what's your, I will not what's your, what's your, travel. But I will not travel on Ryanair. It's just fuck no. It's just they do it so wrong. It's like, like I just what? Them any what do you mean? They right. just do everything wrong. They just do it the wrong fucking way. They just they're assholes at every juncture. Their customer service is whatever. You know, they're like, what what do you mean whatever? It's like we meant whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like, what are you gonna do? You need to get from this place to that place right now, so fuck you. You gotta deal with it. I hate those people, man. <laughs> fuck Ryanair. Fuck Ryanair, man. <laughs> If you see me on Ryanair, you know that it's not me. It's somebody else that looks like me. <laughs> What's your routine like? Are you, are you when you say you're flying about a lot? Are you not? Is most of your work not in the UK? Well, I mean, it, it's one of those things where if I'm if I'm doing stuff with the criminals, there's uh, there's all over Europe we play. So like you name it, Eastern Europe, we do a lot of a lot of stuff. We used to go to Russia a lot, and you know Asia, we go probably once a year. Australia. So a lot of it's outside the country. The thing is, since I've been, since we got the, the deal back in 95, I've been traveling. So I've been traveling on Virgin and a lot of the other uh, airlines, but I have the, the flying club car, right? So if I buy now, because I have so many, I have like almost 
I think I probably have more air miles than I know what to do with. But it means that every time I buy an economy ticket, like say I'm going to New York, buy an economy ticket for 300, but because I'm the super VIP, you know, platinum guy, they automatically update to upgrade that to like premium economy. And then when I get to the plane, if there's a free first class ticket, they're like, my man. So it's like, I can't complain at all now. But, you know, there were times where, you know, I fly, you know, we used to fly TAP, Air Portugal, because they used to let you smoke cigarettes. They didn't get, we used to fly only the airlines that would let you smoke. So there was like, there was Olympia Airlines, there was TAP, there was Air Japan. Uh, it, you know, there was, uh, was it Air India used to let you smoke? Yeah, we used to be crazy back in the day, man. <laughs> Do you have to maintain your um, radio commitments when, you, when you're touring? So, yeah, most of the time they're really kind of cool about it. What's happening now is obviously I'm recording it from this room, right? So it's because needs be. But I've been saying to them, yo, let me record it, for, you know, and it'll it'll be okay. It'll work out. So, you know, I, I probably – I'm allowed to do some pre-recording if I'm going doing a tour or something like that. I can maybe do two pre-records in a row. So two weeks I'll be live one week on take two weeks and then live the fourth week. I think that's how they prefer it to be. But they don't give me a hard time. They, I mean, the, the whole idea is I'm I'm on the radio. I think because I'm a working musician, right? So they they don't want me to not be a working musician because it kind of defeats the purpose of having a working musician being a DJ. Mm. Yeah, mate. I need to ask you again because last time I I forgot to record the answer. <laughs> last time we had a, we had a lot of fun, my man. That's gonna be like the lost episode of the podcast. <laughs> You have to sign. You have to sign like a, not a con- confidentiality agreement. You can watch it. You know, you yeah, can't rat I, me out. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for listening, last time wasn't the first time you came on. There's, yeah, there's, there's a, there's an episode lost in the in the, the lost triangle of podcast. <laughs> but um, my man, Bags, Bags Simmons. Yeah. He had. He wants to know, and I'm, I'm inclined. I'm inclined to agree with him and his observation. The lady on the front cover of the Mimosa album. Okay. Mm-hmm. He wants to know, because uh, it looks like Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. Who, who he must fancy the ass off of. Yeah. I mean, she was a fox back in the day. I haven't yeah. seen her recently. I haven't seen her. Re- I heard she. I actually heard she's a bit of an. I don't know where you heard it from. Where did I hear it from? She was a bit Sigourney of a nightmare. Sigourney Weaver was in fucking Avatar. Avatar. That's what my son would be like. The girl from Avatar. The lady from. No, Avatar. no, 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 no. I know who she is. I meant. I meant. Why? Well, but back in the Ghostbusters, Sigourney Weaver, right? That one. What I meant was, I heard that she was a bit, used to be a bit of a flipping nightmare as an actress, prima donna. But they probably all are an actress as well. Oh, anyway, yeah. um, probably well, my old man told me because he fancied the house as well. It, anyway, the question is, the lady on the front cover of Mimosa, is that Sigourney Weaver? No, I'd say it's probably Farrah Fawcett Majors. You know, remember from Charlie's Angels, the blonde lady with the curly hair? She was the, yeah. the one with the wavy hair and shit. In why, my why mind's eye, that's who it is. In my mind's eye, yeah. Who is it? I, my, my wife's blonde, so I kind of like blondes, you know, so I guess that's how I'm rolling. But yeah. in, my, in my mind, yeah, I was thinking it was Farrah Fawcett. It just, you know, because, you know, I used to live on Maui, right? And when we did the original uh, Mimosa, we recorded a lot of it on Maui at Walter Becker from Sealy Dan, had a studio out there called Hyperbolic Sound, right? And it was Maui. Maui, on, Maui in Hawaii, yeah, in Hawaii. Oh. Right. Yeah, and, I, and you know, I lived out there for a better part of a year, off and on, because we were doing a lot of traveling to Asia and Australia and America. So I was living there instead of New York. It was better for the jet lag. Anyway, it worked out. But I used to love the idea of, you know, the blonde bombshell on the beach. And the thing about Hawaii is you don't really see that. It's not that kind of place. Like, you don't see the girl all made up on the beach, like, hey, I'm on the beach. It's usually uh, a real kind of, like, very attractive athletic woman paddle surfing. And you're like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, you know. It's a different vibe. But with that one, we were out there and it was kind of like we, were, we had done the covers of songs that we liked from back in the day. And we were listening to a lot of 70s kind of like funk music because we were shooting a movie called Maui Homicide 2000 out there. And we were trying to do the soundtrack as well. So we were getting in all the 70s kind of shit. And when we were kind of making the, the record, we thought that the cover should reflect the idea of a very stylized point in the seventies where there's someone drinking some mimosas out on the beach, the sun's, the sun's setting and all that kind of shit. You know? And it's funny, the new one, cause we did a mimosa, another mimosa last year, we put that out and that's kind of got the lady, but it's nighttime and they're three empty glasses. So Sigourney's had a couple, you know, <laughs> that reminds me of the, uh, the 
uh, the final scene on Carlito's way, where she's da- dancing around. Yeah, the dancing beach. around the beach. Man, like yeah. that. that was an amazing yeah. movie, wasn't it, man? Mate, and how many people don't know about it or will never watch it? I know, it's unbelievable. If any, like, that's the thing about lockdown. We we're talking about how I watched The Godfather 50 times because I've watched every fucking movie. I was in a band. We used to tour around Europe with VCR tapes in the back of a tour bus. We watched everything a million times. And that's what, that's one of the things, like, my t- the guy who produces my radio show, this guy T Bone, right? T Bone's never seen Scarface with Al Pacino. And like I'm like, yo, during the lockdown, you gotta you gotta make a little bit of fucking time for yourself, T Bone, and watch fucking Scarface, man. It's something you need to watch. He's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know where I can get it. I was like, fuck it, it's on YouTube, right? Like I literally copied the link off YouTube and sent them the link on a text. I was like, you got no excuse, my man. And some people just they can't sit in front of a movie and, and absorb it. I don't know, man. He's really busy too. His wife's pregnant and he's got a little baby, but still, you can find an hour and forty seven minutes to watch some fucking Scarface, man. I might watch Carlito's Way tonight, actually. Hey, how'd you, how'd you... as well. That's De Palma as well, man, who did Carlito's Way, right? It's what, sorry? It's the same director, I think, the Brian De Palma, wasn't it? Is it? Yeah, I think so. Uh. I think he, that's why he did he did Scarface with Al Pacino, and then like 20 years later, he did, or 15 years later, he did uh, Carlito's Way with him. Oh, it, yeah, I think it's a De Palma film, man. The internet will correct us if we're wrong. I didn't realize that. Uh, mate, when you cut, no, we'll, we'll knock it off in a minute. My, yeah. my, uh, that bleeping, my, um, my leg of lamb is nearly done. <laughs> lamb on a Thursday. All right. Uh, how do you, how do you knock about now? If you want about tour buses, do you still tour bus now or do you Uber? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's funny you say that because if we, we rarely, I mean, this summer we were probably going to do maybe a couple, a couple gigs on a tour bus because if you're taking everybody from, say, Northern England, like, you know, you're up in Newcastle and you got to get the next day, you got to get the band, the crew, the equipment down to a festival and say Reading. That's the only way to really do it all at once. I mean, sometimes we do stuff where the, 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 the equipment goes in a truck and the crew drive a van and they go with the equipment somewhere and then we fly. I mean, we, we try to make it as easy on us as we can and try to really put our crew through it and try to make their lives really miserable because, you know, that's how it's supposed to be. No, I'm, I'm joking, of course. But yeah, I mean, a lot of times they do do all the fucking hard drives. But I mean, it, it's strange because I don't know what's going to happen after this. Like how many gigs are going to be going on? Oop, I see my wife. Oop, she's looking down. Oop, she's happy. All right, we're good. <laughs> well, mate, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this lift. I've only been to, um, I think in my life, I've been to maybe four fucking gigs. Not well, many. Dude, I'll tell I, you I, what, man. Next time we, next time the criminals play a gig and you're you're able to come to it, be my guest, man. Come out. Nah, so, mate, I, I, yeah, I appreciate wife, it. I love it. Girl, that wasn't, that wasn't me kidding? angling for freebies. No, no, no. I know, I know you weren't. That's why I offered. <laughs> no, cheers, mate. Yeah, no, it'd be great. I, I literally would have been at four or five. And it's fucking weird because I love like you guys music. send me. You have those t-shirts in black, the H hour. Yeah. You have but, black t-shirt with the white. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. Double XL, man. Double F F- Fuck's sake, you are charging me for the tickets. Where's <laughs> the other one I gave you? <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the rugby jersey you gave my son's got, man. He took that the minute Has I he? got home. Yeah. Man, I love those. I love yeah, those. Cool. Like, yeah, very cool. rug, the rugby heroes jersey. Huey, mate, it's been an absolute fucking pleasure. Huey, always a pleasure to hang with you, my bro. Listen, I'll catch you in a few months. Absolutely. You. I'll speak to you beforehand. Hey, I'm around, man. We should do this soon, man. Love to the family, buddy. Back at yours, my brother. Stay strong, stay frosty, stay classy.